So Darwin's hamsters got me really interested in reading about the evolution of the eye and uh, trying to relate it to mutation. And it does seem like the eye evolved very quickly. Um, over the span of a few million years, Darwin's hamster said, uh, I think a half a million. But uh, let me check that out. 430,000 years might be a reasonable period. Most of it probably could have evolved in that short of a time span, but I guess this other scientist on Wikipedia is being more conservative about it. Still, it's the blink of an eye, you know, whether it's half a million years or a few million years. Uh, during the Cambrian explosion, really, is when uh, the eyeball developed, uh, or at least accelerated. I mean, the few million year span is during this Cambrian explosion when all the sea creatures started to develop eyes. Um, or at least that's what Andrew Parker suggests. He's the scientist that said it took a few million years for the eye to develop. Um, so, yeah, it was the eye developed through a series of, of small mutations. Um, first, just a, a basic uh, layer of pigment with some kind of photoreceptors developed on the, on the surface of the skin, um, you know, connected to nerve fibers. And that just allowed this basic sensitivity to light and dark by proxy. And um, that obviously was a great evolutionary advantage to whatever organism developed it. And then the next mutation was that this, this photoreceptor sort of got cupped into a sleeve of skin with a pretty wide opening. And that just it allows you to uh, have a directional sense at least a little bit, like you know if something's over here because it hits this side, and if you know something's over here because it hits this side. Um, but as this opening got narrower and narrower, the organism found it had a more and more acute sense of its world because it could get a finer sense of detail as far as the direction of the light. And then, uh, of course, you get an actual lens forming. That's a big mutation. Uh, when this fills up with liquid first and then an actual lens and, and uh, retina forms the cornea uh, then you get color like it's like a prism it breaks the light apart so not only do you get light and dark but you get a whole spectrum of color and then you know every mutation after that is just the further development of the sensitivity of, of the eye and um, the human eyes is pretty uh, complex and it's really a lot of the um, creationists love to look at the eye and say, look, how did that develop by natural selection? And, uh, you know, Darwin was was amazed by the complexity of the eye, no doubt, but he, you know, in the Origin of Species, I'll just read it, this is from the Origin of Species, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Yet reason tells me that if numerous gradations from a perfect and complex eye to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being useful to its possessor, can be shown to exist if further the uh, if further the eye does vary ever so slightly and the variations be inherited, which is certainly the case. And if any variation or modification in the organ can be ever useful to an animal under changing conditions of life, then the, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection, though insuperable by our imagination, can hardly be considered real. So that's Darwin. So. That's like a partial explanation, but every scientist after him pretty much followed that same idea, and it's probably for good reason. Um, so it seems like the... Okay, as the eye becomes more and more sensitive, the organism gains a better and better understanding of itself because it's becoming more aware of what's outside of itself. And knowing what's outside of yourself is really what allows you to have a sense of self. You know, the other, whatever you deem other, is the boundary of yourself. And your, the boundary of yourself is what 
teams are the other. So these, you know, there's a two-way street there. And I think as as animals begin to become more and more awake, I mean, you can see why is the eye developing? Why does okay? It's sensitivity that allows for greater survival. So of course it's going to keep developing, but greater survival within an ecosystem. Greater survival. Why does the organism want to survive, though? That's what I'm always interested in. You know, not that it does survive. Yeah, we can see that it does survive. But why does it want to survive? You know, we consider, that's the libido, the, the blind lust for life. That's all that uh, a scientific viewpoint can admit is internal to any biological life form. Um, because life fundamentally is just matter, and matter is just this blind force, this causal process. So we can't say that this higher, even though it's an organic life, it's still made of matter. And that being made of matter, we can't say that it has anything inside directing it from within outwards because that doesn't happen in matter. So where does that just appear from in biology? So the only thing that a biologist can admit an organism has driving it is, is uh, the survival instinct. Um, you know, which that's what they have to do because they're reductionistic. Uh, so Freud would have been, Freud is a naturalist psychologist, and he would only admit that the unconscious was this libido, this blind lust for life, this instinct for food and sex and anything else that we really seem to want in life, like religion and spirituality and and you know culture and poetry and literature these are just these are just rep these are sexuality repressed in a weird and interesting way but it really all represents you know sex um, so everything was based on sex for Freud and Jung was a student of Freud's but he, he saw that Freud was just obsessed by sex and that there was there were higher faculties of the unconscious as well. There weren't just this blind lust. There was not only the intelligence, but the spirit and the soul and these these higher intuitional states of, of consciousness that humans have access to that can't be reduced to biology or physics. Um, so, you know, I guess what I, I really got off on a tangent there, but just talking about how the eye makes makes the organism more aware, and as it becomes more aware of the world around it, it becomes more aware of itself, and its inner world starts to develop just as much as its outer world is becoming more acute. Um, and the biology usually doesn't want to pay attention to that aspect of it. Um, you know, you look at some simple organisms don't seem that amazing. You know, but a, but think about it, a jellyfish doesn't even have eyes. It's a it's a glowing ball of jelly that, that pulsates and somehow gets around by following temperature and, and light. It's amazing, it doesn't have a brain. It's just I mean it's alive, right? And that's one of the four first organisms. And we all came from that. So we're fundamentally somehow the same. And I can't remember who said it, but um, somebody said that, you know, human beings carry every stage of evolution along with them. So the human body is 70% water. So basically what happened, evolutionarily speaking, is the water grew a bag around itself and started walking on land. And uh, here we are.